Tra Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 186, recorded on July 31st, 2020. Dracon Yellow and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. And from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, you know, I, I don't I don't you know it's in a sense good for me to be able to see you guys, but um I, I always feel self-conscious when we're, you know, being uh being filmed, uh, you know, Why? I signed up, when I signed up for the podcast, I thought it would just be an audio thing. Well, no, Daniel, pod- you're so photogenic. What are you worried about? <laughs> the pandemic changed. The pandemic very, changed. Very kind of you, Dixon. The pandemic That's true. changed everything. No, but Daniel, you, uh, if you'd like, I could put a black square above your video. <laughs> no, no, Kermit the Frog. We do the Kermit the Frog if you don't show up. <laughs> you have an expanding uh, collection of books behind you. You know, I I do actually, and uh, you know, we've got we've got back there. We have parasitic diseases. We do. We have our Spanish edition, Enfermidades Parasitarias, and then we also have our medical handbook for limited resource settings, uh, right. Volume One V One or Version One, um, and then we've also got principles and practice of pediatric infectious diseases. Hmm. Cool. Um, and Dixon and I, right? We've we've. Uh, collaborated in the past. I know Dixon's trying to sort of, you know, free me of the mentorship. You can do it on your own, Daniel, but no, no, you've already done it. You've (laughs) already done it. I've done that for so many years. I would gladly hand the reins over to you. I gladly do that. I think we have a chapter due for that textbook for the next edition. So hopefully we've actually sent it in and it's on, uh, I think it's on nematodes, tissue invasive nematodes. Yes. Yes. Speaking of parasites without borders, did you reach your goal, Daniel? Oh, this is fantastic. Um, I want to thank everybody. We reached our goal, and we were able to contribute $40,000 to Femrec, to Foundation. That's fantastic. Nice. Very good. It is. So, yeah. So, I think that's really going to help out the clinic in Beduda. And, you know, today was the last day. So we we hit our goal, which is great. And when this gets released, you're probably going to be in August, right? Right. And so let, let this be our chance to announce that we're going to now try to help out another organization, Floating Doctors. Mm. Uh, cool. I think some of our longtime listeners have probably heard cases, yeah. um, you know, down there seeing leishmaniasis or scabies or all kinds of other wonderful, well, wonderful parasitic diseases, uh, intellectual, <laughs> not from a uh, human mm. experience. Um, but this group is a group that was uh, founded by Ben Lebrot. He's a very, uh, he's much more charismatic than I am. I just have to say that. um, <laughs> That's not possible. That's totally <laughs> impossible. <laughs> and uh, no, you know, there's certain people you meet, they just have like that charisma. Like, you know, I think if he wanted to start a cult, which maybe he did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, he, he got like a lot of people excited. And what, um, Floating Doctors um, does now is they're based on a small island um, in the um, Bocas del Toro archipelago, right, in northeastern Panama. And they go out to all the villages where the indigenous uh, populations, the Nobe populations live, and they're somewhat neglected uh, peoples. And um, they try to go at least every three months to each of these small villages providing medical care. And unfortunately, with COVID-19, there's tremendous food insecurity, and the people down there are literally literally starving to death. Mm. Um, When Ben's group's gone around, the people, the you know, we talk about in America, everyone put on their pandemic pounds. Everyone has put on 15 pounds on average. In these villages, the average weight loss is 15 pounds. Good heavens. I haven't put on 15 pounds. No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Vincent didn't well, put on 15 pounds. What about you, Dixon? Did you put on your 15 pounds? I, I'd take the fifth on that one. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so we're going to launch um, for <laughs> August and September. Um, hopefully we can do the same thing for floating doctors to allow oh, them you know, sure. to feed the people and to continue to provide medical care. Because, you know, what's happened in a lot of countries, um, and this was, I think we described in some countries in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, is that a lot of populations that really were, were dependent upon outside help, um, that outside help dried up. We don't have a lot of people going and volunteering. Um, a lot of people are, you know, 
not donating to the extent that they used to before to a lot of these organizations. So um, floating doctors really needs our help. So I encourage everyone to go to um, Parasites Without Borders and donate during August and uh, September. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to match um, up to giving them a contribution of $40,000, which I'm hoping we can hit. Nice. Very good. That was great. That's great. Yeah. So no, right. thanks for asking. That's That's excellent. I forgot to ask last night on TWIV, so there you go. Uh, before, well, we get to announce it first on TWIP, right? That's, right. that's more appropriate. No, exactly right. You know, I exactly hate being right. second fiddle to TWIP. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon, uh, before we start our case, uh, can you read this l nice limerick that's been sent to us by James? I would be delighted. It's uh, called levity. That's what he calls this. On the man was a tick from Nantucket. From his skin through its nose, it could suck it. A Beezia rings or Borrelia springs, he should have taken the time to pluck it. <laughs> What's Borrelia springs? What does that mean? I guess Borrelia is a spirochete, so it looks like a spring. I see. Oh, would you get that on your skin at the bite site? No. No. Actually, no, this no, is so injected. The yeah, so the Borrelia burgdorferi, which I think is what he's referring to, it's a yes. spirochete. That's right. And it does. It looks like a spring. Exactly, um, exactly right. And so, yeah, the same tick um, that carries Borrelia can carry something called Babesia. I suspect that uh, Dr. <laughs> Small is, uh, <laughs> is making a guess here regarding our case. Could be. He just might be. Yeah, he does have a separate <laughs> guest, so we'll see what he does. <laughs> well, speaking of case, Daniel, what do we have today? Oh, certainly. Let me um, let me remind everyone who is uh, tuning back in or uh, for the first time, for people who are clicking in, uh, give the story. We had a case um, from TWIP 185, um, and this was a 75-year-old female admitted with fever, body aches, cough, loose stool, uh, been gone on for a couple weeks. Her sodium was quite low. It was 118. Normal sodium, I'll say, is about 135, 140. Um, she had been sheltering in place in Long Island, doing some gardening, um, no travel. Th this is recent, right? So this is occurring during the COVID pandemic here. Right. Um, the blood testing had revealed that low sodium. She had a COVID-19 test, which was negative. Um, her blood work revealed a low white blood cell count down at about 2000. Um, she was anemic with a hematocrit of 24. Her platelets were low at 40. Um, the exam was, was unremarkable, you know, and I, I do a very thorough exam. Um, her Lyme test was negative. Her other tick-borne diseases were negative. And um, we, we left this out there for people to think, what, what could this person have had. Um, I don't think we mentioned too much last time, but there may have been tick exposure. I'll, I'll throw that in there. If people want to pause and think right now, what could the differential possibly be? Hmm. No, we didn't mention that last time. Hmm. Given a little extra hint this time, right? I'm being nice during the pandemic. Dixon, you take that first <laughs> one, please. Dixon. Okay. Peter writes <clears throat> a charade. No, he gives you a pronunciation there. A uh, kaharda. Kardia. <laughs> kaharda. A kaharda. Ka ka kaharda. I don't know. Peter, uh, you're going to have to record your email and then we could just play it and avoid. <laughs> we could do that. We could do that. <laughs> okay. So, at any rate, he's writing this to Twip, obviously. Listening to Daniel's case study, the Grateful Dead song, Fire on the Mountain, stayed playing in my mind. I believe the patient has Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The symptoms seem to align, including low sodium. Although tick-borne disease tests were negative, to quote ColumbiaLyme.org, while a number of laboratory tests are available for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, none are both rapid and sensitive enough to provide useful diagnostic assistance to the examining physician. I have one parasitic diseases sixth edition already. Well, in that case, no, no, I won't go any further. <laughs> on parasitic songs, <clears throat> I know that you're collecting evolutionary ones on Twivo. I'm not sure if mentioned on Twip before, but I love Hookworm Blues by Blind Blake that contains the lines, Hookworm in your body and your food don't do you no good. 
educating <laughs> the masses on the link with anemia since 1929. Also, it may be of interest to listeners to know that to celebrate his 90th birthday, Professor William Campbell launched his new book, Catching the Worm. It is a fantastic memoir I would recommend to anyone interested in parasitology or to quote Professor Campbell in An Inexhaustible Garden of Worms. You can hear an interview to mark the launch here, and he gives a link. Lots of wisdom is shared in the interview, and I'm sure the TWIP professors would appreciate Professor Campbell's timely caution on preliminary studies of SARS-CoV-2 and the need for controlled studies at around 17 minutes of the interview. Finally, another of my parasitology heroes, Professor Celia Holland, was interviewed in the journal Trop in the journal Tropical Parasitology, and he gives a link there. Professor Holland has not allowed the difficulty in securing funding from neglected diseases to prevent her pursuing a career that greatly advances our knowledge of ascaridity. Instead, <clears throat> her infectious passion for all things parasitology has meant she has constantly maintained a diverse and active research group working on parasites of humans, wild mammals, fish, livestock, invertebrates, to name just a few. To quote Professor Campbell again, Professor Holland also writes the books that helps the rest of us to make sense of oceans of information that these days engulf us. I was lucky enough to be postdoc of Professor Holland before taking up a lecturing position. And that's all he writes. Slancha. Slon right. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Loncha, which means, I guess, so long. Slonky. Slonke. Is this so Gaelic by any chance we're looking at? You know, a lot of uh, people in Ireland refer to it now as Irish because there's different types of Gaelic. Um, I remember my my grandmother who spoke Gaelic. She she used to call it Gaelic. Um, but yeah, a lot of the a lot of the Irish sailing instructors that I that I've worked with over the years they now refer to it as Irish. Hmm. Huh? All right. And uh, Daniel, take the next one, please. Um, Styler writes, good morning, Twipsters. It is a muggy 90F here in D.C., which only makes social distancing easier, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've missed the last two write-ins. I did listen to the podcast, but was preoccupied with moving into my parents' house and then into my new apartment. Oh, I'm wow. now settled in and eagerly awaiting my first year of medical school, which starts in August. That is exciting. Congratulations. Uh, classes will be virtual for the first semester. Oh, dear. On to the case in episode 185. I started with the New York Department of Health website. When Vincent mentioned that there's a mosquito-borne infection going around, I thought mm. EEE, -E -E, equine encephalitis. Uh, but that's a viral disease. The only other equine, eastern equine, uh, the only other mosquito-borne outbreak in Long Island reported on the website is West Nile, West Nile virus, another mm -hmm. virus. Was this comment by Vincent a red herring or just something not mentioned on the New York Department of Health website? I, it did get me wondering, though, what are the rarest cases you have personally diagnosed or treated? <laughs> when shadowing doctors during college, I saw a suspected case of acute sporadic CJD. So mm -hmm. that's Crutzfield Jakob disease. Yep. Its effects were devastating and left such an impression on me that I don't think I'll ever forget the patient. She had gone from walking and talking to wheelchair bound and nearly mute over the course of a month. Oh my. Considering the sheltering in place, I limited my search to parasites endemic to Long Island. <laughs> While Dr. Griffin mentioned negative tests for ehrlichiosis, Lyme, and anaplasmosis, he didn't mention whether or not the patient was tested for babesiosis, anemia, fever, Long Island, and parasite mm -hmm. makes me think babesiosis. I'm not sure if hyponatremia is common in cases of babesiosis, but I'll stick with my guess. All the best, Shiler. Mm. Mm -hmm. Dan writes, hi, Twip. I missed out on a guess last time, but I am back. <laughs> <laughs> the, the symptoms, time of year, and location seem to suggest that babesiosis is the most likely culprit. I'm not sure if I would have been included in the tick-borne disease, if it would have been included in the tick-borne diseases tested for. If I am right, and this actually is the case, treatment is with etovaquone and azithromycin. 
Interestingly enough, it seems that atofaquone might inhibit SARS-CoV-2 in vitro, and there is a clinical trial enrolling to use atofaquone ethazithromycin in the treatment of COVID-19. Happy summer, and if you're outside the Northeast U.S., be sure to check for ticks. Right. (laughs) Hmm. Ticks. James writes, First, as a, para, as a pathologist, I want to know, does this look like consumption coagulopathy with, with schistocytes? What's a schistocyte? <laughs> I looked they're around actually, and found a few they're, parasites. They're, so, yeah, they're red blood cells that are somewhat fragmented. Schistocytes. So I've never schisto, heard that term before. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I looked around and found a few parasites associated with hemolytic anemia and or hyponatremia. Strangeloides is associated with SIAHD, but not so much with hemocyt. SIAHD seems to be what took my father away. Oh, dear. Visceral leishmaniasis can do this, but unless global warming is really advanced, I doubt if it's in New York travel history. Babesia seems the most likely to me, although I did not in a quick Google will find Babesia with hyponatremia and, of course, a drug reaction to her antibiotic. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. What is the drug reaction to refer to the um, fever? Atovacron and uh, azithromycin? I don't know. I don't know why. Trying, to, trying to think if there was an antibiotic, but I don't think this uh, individual was on an antibiotic before I saw them. Yeah. Um, okay. So. All right, Ted Dixon, Daniel, sorry. Sophia writes, hello, doctors. Hope you're enjoying your summer. My guess for this case is Babesiosis. First, because this is the time of year that Dr. Griffin presents such cases. <laughs> <laughs> and second, Not because fair. I can't think of anything else. <laughs> well, you can say this, like, if she's right, this will be, you know, sort of a, a reward for the, the frequent listeners. I didn't think that cough was a symptom, but then I found a paper, which gives us a link to a paper that did list this symptom along with Hmm. others to the point that it totally sounded like (laughs) COVID-19 complications (laughs) include adult respiratory stress syndrome. Yeah, look at that. Pulmonary edema, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Wow. Oh, brother. I'm glad this doctor didn't just assume it's another COVID case. Um, I'm going to come back to this email. Um, doctor, because <laughs> I have an I have a good story. Um, doctor, I think it's a good story. <laughs> doctor Griffin, I have a lot of respect for you. The more I listen to you on Twiv, the more it grows. I hope you do get to rest and vacation. Thank you for all you do. I've learned so much. Greetings from Greece, Sophia. How cool! Okay. Uh, what writes, dear Twipsters? Uh, my turn, dude. It's my turn. It's your turn. Yeah, but if you want to read, it's okay. No, no, no. I thought it was my turn. That's okay. Uh, I'd like to see that excitement, Dixon. Yeah, Take it's it. Good. <laughs> Take it's it, good. Vincent. <laughs> All right. Wyatt writes, Dear Twipsters, my name is Wyatt, and I'm writing today from sunny Wheaton, Illinois. We sheltering in, we are sheltering in place. I just downloaded your seventh edition PD in preparation for beginning medical school with Loma Linda on July 29th. I was, is that in California? Yeah, Loma Linda. Is, yes, uh, Southern yes. California. It's a, it's it a fantastic school. So congratulations, Wyatt. I was just leafing through it and getting excited for the upcoming year. And I thought, heck, why don't I try for a hard copy? There you I go. I find myself drawn to infectious diseases and wonder if that may be what I will pursue in school. Mm-hmm. I began listening to TWIP while delivering for Amazon this past spring after I had lost my normal job to coronavirus. Your podcast made the delivery job much more enjoyable and interesting, and hopefully no one got a wrong package as a result. (laughs) (laughs) I believe that the offending parasite this week is a malaria, probably Plasmodium falciparum. Fever is an obvious symptom, but the rapid anemia and low sodium levels also hint to this parasite. I did want to ask why sodium are affected by malaria. Anemia makes sense given the life cycle, but why hyponatremia? With global temperatures rising, many tropical diseases are traveling north, This is one of the reasons I'm so interested in an ID. Other thoughts that came to mind would be dengue fever, but this is viral, not for this show. I've also considered Encelostoma duodenale or N. americanus because of the anemia and that she has been gardening recently extensively. I do not think this is the case because of its high fever and the rapid onset, but these would also cause rampant anemia. One other thought was T. cruzi. However, the fever would most likely have gone away more quickly. 
This is also primarily transmitted at nighttime while sleeping in a house with a thatched roof. That was most likely not the case on Long Island. Thanks again for all the insight and hours went well spent this past spring. <laughs> okay. Uh, Luke writes, a uh, 75-year-old female admitted with fever, body aches, cough, loose stool for two weeks, sodium 118. After some research on up-to-date, my guess is St. Louis encephalitis. As long as we're keeping with the viruses or parasites rhetoric, there was also a clue from Vincent suggesting a mosquito vector. She's negative for tick-borne diseases. I think the low sodium is due to SIADH from an encephalitis. I think that the St. Louis encephalitis is the only arbovirus in the United States that causes both an encephalitis and respiratory symptoms, as well as GI symptoms. Thanks, Luke from Canberra, Australia. Mm. Interesting. Okay. A Wayne writes, dear Twip, mm. my guess for this week's case is that this lady has babesiosis. I'm not entirely sure of my diagnosis. As you said, the tests for other tick-borne diseases, such as Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, were negative. But since babesia wasn't specifically mentioned, I'm going to stick with it. Given her lack of travel anywhere else, it must be something endemic to Long Island, which Babesia is reported to be. Her gardening likely gives her time to be exposed to the tick vector. And the vague symptoms, fever, body aches, mouth cough, loose stools, as well as the more alarming blood picture of pancytopenia would fit. She's also in a higher risk group for more severe disease due to her age, which means she's relatively immunosuppressed. The only thing I couldn't pin clearly on Babesia was the low sodium. Is that just due to her being older and her homeostasis being upset by infection, or is this something more specific to Babesiosis? I also have to apologize for the confusion about my name last time. The pronunciation <laughs> guy was intended to help, but clearly it made it too complex <laughs> for my own good. <laughs> Owen is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember this actually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I'm now working my way through TWIV and TWIM too. There are so many hours of educational material to catch up on. Um, thanks again for the great podcast and keep going. Um, keep doing what you do. Yours sincerely. Uh -huh. Owen. <laughs> I'm going to pronounce it Owen instead of Owain. That's uh, right. Yeah. What is it? There's, there's thousands over like a thousand hours of TWIV alone. So yeah. Could keep you busy for a while. I'll say. Andrew writes, Kia Ora from Pongaroa. No book one yet. Who needs a book? Not much time to read with all these <laughs> twick Zoom casts. I'm very happy to say I get to see pets, strategically placed books, and that would be Daniel's strategically placed books, right? And <laughs> what you all look like. I also see that I've been misspelling Dixon's name. Sorry. Weather, 13C overcast, occasional rain, COVID-19, 77 days without community transmission in New Zealand. I would like to point out we had a huge advantage with our team of 5 million efforts to eliminate SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Susie Wiles, a microbiologist and sun science communicator, she heroically explained in understandable terms that developing science to the country on a daily basis during our lockdown and regularly since, science educators rock case of the lady gardener ticks are excluded so i think we have to look at worms and of those i'm forced to think of hookworms i'm assuming she picked up the critters a technical term according to rich condit while gardening <laughs> with modern sanitation the chances of it being a human hookworm like nicator or ancylostoma are unlikely i now have to think of an animal vector probably a pet that defecated in the garden under lockdown conditions, animals would be able to roam more freely and people bored with sheltering in place might get out in the garden more. This would explain a recent rise in cases. Other considerations would be a malaria bought by, brought by mosquitoes stowing away on an international flight, but there are no flights. Cryptosporidium maybe, but there is no mention of a water habitat. So I don't like my diagnosis much and almost hope it's something else. I'm still in for the book draw, even if I am wrong. Namihi Andrew. Well, Dixon. You get Elise, Dixon. That's right. That's, I get a chance to correct this, too. Uh, <laughs> Elise writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, greetings from a semi-abandoned lower Manhattan. 
where it's 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 32.7 degrees centigrade. As always, I need to tell you how grateful I am to all of you for your work, your interest, your energy. All of your podcasts are so inspiring and engaging. There are days when things feel very hard, and I find myself re-listening to the recent episodes of TWIP and TWIV that most challenged me as an unscientist, and I hope I'm learning and progressing. After failing in last month's diagnosis, I'm seeking redemption with the Long Island Gardener. I suspect she may have babesiosis. During this period of sheltering in, she has been gardening, which has kept her safely distant from other people and much less at risk for being exposed to COVID-19. But the hobby has made her much more available to interactions with local fauna and in the form of ticks. Several varieties of tick prevalence on Long Island, some of which are rather new to the region, have crept up from the south, can transmit many pathogens simultaneously. Among the greatest hits of diseases spread by ticks on Long Island are Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and Borrelia myamotoi. Most of those diseases are caused by bacterial infections spread by tick bites, but babesia is a pyroplasm also spread by tick bites. While many people can be transfected with Babesia microti and have no symptoms at all, the patient is in an age group that typically, typically does have a greater chance for suffering from the cascade of malaria-esque symptoms brought on by babesiosis. While our fever, flu-like symptoms, and GI issues are common to many infections, the blood work suggests the blood work results revealing hyponatremia, very low white cell count, platelet and hematocrit counts also suggest hemolytic anemia, for which Babesia causes. I do hope the patient responds to treatment because it seems like such an insult in what are already difficult and worrisome circumstances. I hope she is undaunted and keeps up with her gardening. I attempted some apartment sunflower planting in this period and have not exactly had wild success. I actually suspect a parasite. Huge thanks and many best wishes to all of you. Your work is so important and your presence means the world to me. The best, best Elsie from Lower Manhattan. Elise in Lower Manhattan. So Elise, Jody Elise I'm sorry, Elise. Elise. Jody writes, dear Vincent, Daniel, and Dixon. Hello from sunny Seattle where nine out of 10 people in my neighborhood anyway are wearing masks on the street and 10 out of 10 in all indoor spaces. Excellent. And where only the very occasional individual reaches up and pulls the mask off of a store owner to spin their face when they're told oh, they cannot oh. enter without wearing one. <laughs> Jeez. Oh. Yeah, I think she's describing some magical world, except for the last sentence there. Today, my family and I visited a free drive through testing site run by our local fire department. Everyone was friendly, funny, and professional. And yeah. my seven-year-old daughter, a budding virologist, braced nice. her booger swab while squeezing her beloved stuffed tardigrade. <laughs> I love I love tardigrades. How many I, kids have <laughs> stuffed tardigrades? That's great. It was set up in the old emissions testing site, and my husband and I agreed that our brain biopsies, <laughs> I think it was Ori <laughs> Lieberman who used this phrase, were much more pleasant than any emissions test we ever found ourselves forced to endure there, despite the fact that I experienced a taste of adrenaline shakes on the second nostril. <laughs> in and out in nine minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for being my constant companions, not just during this pandemic, but for the last six years. Oh, I've nice. been lurking quietly until 2020 when I finally broke the seal and wrote <laughs> to TWIV a few times. All of your Twixers have played a great role inspiring me to go back to school to study infectious disease after a 20-year career in graphic design mm -hmm. and inspiring my daughter to want to become a virologist. They're not eukaryotic parasites, but I thought you might get a kick out of seeing the bacterium stuffed animal and virus <laughs> model she made a few months back, and that's attached. Right. Uh, so on to the 75-year-old woman from Long Island who's been gardening up a storm while sheltering in place during the pandemic. Although her exam was unremarkable and she doesn't look ill, her complaints consist of fever, body aches, cough, and loose stools. Despite her having normal blood work three weeks previous, the very recent test showed decreased white blood cells, 
low hematocrit level, low sodium, and very low platelets. Despite Vincent teasing us with a question about mosquitoes right at the end there, my first thought was tick-borne diseases. Here in the Puget Sound, we are blissfully ignorant of just about all tick-borne diseases. But I have read that a number of them are on the rise in the Northeast, thanks to climate change and humans disrupting the landscape and fragmenting forest, creating the edge habitats that small rodents, deer, and the ticks that feed and breed on them love. I admit, I quickly came up with a diagnosis, but we'll run through all the others I discarded. Many of the pathogens spread by ticks are bacterial, anaplasmosis, TBRF, RMSF, tularemia, and likely starry. Others are viral, CTF, Bourbon virus, Heartland virus, and Powassan virus. Mosquito-borne infections include EEE, so Eastern Equine Encephalitis, quite rare, only six reported cases in the U.S. in 2018. WNV, West Nile virus, again a virus, and malaria, which I am not aware of being locally acquired currently in New York. Toxoplasmosis came to mind due to the time spent in the garden, but it seems unlikely that initial infection for a gardener would occur this late in life. And most people who become infected do not suffer the acute onset of signs and symptoms she is experiencing. Which leads me to babesiosis or Long Island malaria. (laughs) Daniel mentioned that he has been seeing about one of these cases per week. And according to the CDC website, New York State has been seeing cases rise slowly but steadily with 696 documented cases of babesiosis in 2017. Babesiosis is caused by an infection with a wee parasite called Babesia microti and is spread through the bite of infected black-legged ticks or Ixodes scapularis the same tick that carries Lyme and anaplasmosis. Nymphs are only the size of a poppy seed. I think we have a link there to poppy seed. And in the Northeast U.S., they are most active in the spring and early summer months, just the time of year when people are gardening and recreating outside. Diagnosis is usually done by examining blood specimens under a microscope and seeing Babesia parasites in blood cells. I'm not a medical doctor, But if I were the closest thing to one in a small village and someone called to me for help, I would do best to lay hands on a 7 to 10 day dose of atovaquin and azithromycin or a cocktail of clindamycin and quinine. When returning to her garden, this patient may want to consider wearing permethrin infused clothing or spritzing her own clothing with the bottled stuff, which is apparently the synthetic form of a compound found in chrysanthemums, which can cause paralysis and death in ticks and mites. She should also begin a habit of doing daily full body checks, including all her nooks and crannies with the help of a good friend or a hand mirror and could take a shower and throw all her clothes in the dryer on high heat when she comes inside to kill any nymphs still hanging to the fabric. Crossing my fingers on winning a signed copy of the book. But if not, I'll write in again and will aim to be more succinct. Thanks for all you do. I hope you're all getting enough sleep and finding time to get outside. Vincent, get some exercise. And then we have a very cute picture of a young lady there with uh, a microbe. Oh, what does it look like? I need to get exercise? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I haven't gained any weight since this uh, pandemic began. Okay. I don't think I've gained weight, Vincent, but I think I've transformed some of my muscle weight into (laughs) (laughs) non-muscle weight. (laughs) Yeah, that's possible. All right, Carol writes, Hello, gentlemen. I'm so happy to have found your podcast. I've been enjoying the episodes very much. I would like to contribute an answer to the case study for 185. It appears that this lovely 75-years-old lady may have babesiosis caused by Babesia microti. I made my decision based on her lab results. Home location, Long Island is endemic, and penchant for gardening, gardening where ticks reside, especially in the spring and summer months. In my work as a medical laboratory technologist and current assistant professor at a local community college, I've identified this parasite and taught students both micro and hematology, where they learn to identify the organism and the related blood clinical picture. It's always a challenge to the students to find the tetrads, Maltese crosses of the intracellular parasitic ring forms in a blood smear. 
We learned to distinguish it from the plasmodium ring, ring forms of malaria based on morphology and patient case history. Interestingly, this patient appears to have pancytopenia, which is a known consequence of infection with this organism, due to the hemolytic process and the probable sequestering of platelets in the spleen. Did the patient have purpura? Did they have splenomegaly? I'd love to know. The leukopenia was also expect unexpected for an infection. We normally see this as elevated, especially with microbes, but I suspect that there is an absolute lymphopenia and neutropenia noted on the CBC, but not given here. Resources are not clear on exact causes of neutropenia from what I've read. I was initially confused by the hyponatremia and thought that maybe the cholesterol-lowering meds she was on was causing it or the diarrheal stools she had been experiencing for two weeks most likely and probably not related to the babesiosis. After some research, I found that low sodium is often a consequence of Lyme disease, of which she was negative and could be used as a primary indicator for diagnosis in endemic areas. This was not something I was previously aware of and will be sure to pass on to my future students. Keep up the great podcast. Hope to be answering again soon. Hmm. Right. Vicky writes, Dearest Twippers, it's a lovely 66 degrees Fahrenheit, 19 degrees C in Duluth, Minnesota, home of trampled by turtles. I have no idea what that is. Maybe a singing group. Who knows? <laughs> the weather has turned. It has been hot and humid, something we can't bear. It is a beautiful sunny afternoon here in Duluth, Minnesota, 81 degrees Fahrenheit and 27 degrees C and breezy. Wait a minute. That's uh, that would be the next day, wouldn't it? I don't have any formal training, but general knowledge says this must be hookworm. The gardener could have been infected while engaged in her hobby, and her symptoms would be cough and diarrhea. The podcast will kill you has an informative and funny episode, Opening a Can of Hookworms, episode 23. <laughs> Devotedly yours, Vicky. I love all the microbe TV shows, and I'm an avid listener. I first learned about TWIV from this podcast will kill you, and I'm grateful. Go to Aaron's. I'm waiting for my copy of the textbook for virology when I want to arrive. I'm going to get educated. Sincerely, Vicky, who has an MBA, an MA, and an MFA. <laughs> oh, and she's an MFA candidate. Right? So she says, P.S., my daughter's half-brother is a PhD candidate at Tufts, where he was studying viruses. He, Andrew Whittier Day, got published in Lancet when he was working in a lab in Austin, Minnesota, at Hormel, I think. He tested positive for COVID-19, March 19, self-quarantined, and donated plasma. Also, he recommended TWIV and said, it's Vincent's rack and yellow. So Trampled by Turtles is, is the music on Twivo, Dixon. <laughs> Why am I supposed to know that? Well, they're, would, they're like a bluegrass band out yeah, of Duluth, Dixon. Yeah, they're bl bluegrass, and they play our intro and outro music. You know, uh, Nels Eldy picked it, but it, you should listen to an episode because it's really good, <laughs> Dixon. What else <laughs> do you have Dixon. to do? What else do you have to do? I'm being chastised. No, it's <laughs> fine. I, I have I just you know we have to chastise you. We have to chastise you so that people can write in and say be nice to Dixon. <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. <laughs> It's it's a ploy. It's a ploy. We've been too nice to you that, that people have. They've missed, you, they've missed that. You know what? You're absolutely right, Dan. We've been too <sighs> pandemic pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I have to admit I do feel uh, less picked on during this pandemic than I have been recently. Yeah. So so I have a I have a short one, and then I'm going to give the big one to uh, to Vincent. So Daniel. You are? Here are the quick <laughs> yes for the case. Italy, 34 <laughs> Celsius. I know you said the woman was tested for tick diseases, but I'm going with babesiosis. Thanks for the great show, Daniel. Ah, uh, that was quick. That mm. was too quick. Well, I think Vincent you should take the next one. <laughs> but Vincent, Vincent likes reading Kevin's. <laughs> he does. He does. Right. Uh, Kevin writes, an elderly gardener feeling poorly for two weeks admitted to hospital with hyponatremia. A collision of geography, advanced aged exposure, signs, and symptoms. TWIP case discussed on episode 176, October 9, 2019, hovers in the background. Uh-oh. Suffolk County, New York is tick country. Many tick varieties live here, and a high percentage of the nymphs carry a potpourri of pathogens transmissible to humans. Patients' acute anemia is suspicious for hemolytic anemia since there's no history of blood loss. Low platelets also point in the direction of our culprit. Low sodium, too. Hyponatremia, the most common electrolyte abnormality seen in clinical practice, 
is a big and confusing topic. Relevant here is the fact that hyponatremia is seen in malaria and is attributed to the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Malaria is a cousin to this patient's parasite. In fact, according to the website longisland.com, babesiosis is known as Long Island malaria. Digression from PD7. Babesia had to wait until 1957 to be described as a human pathogen, and in the late 60s was known as Nantucket fever. Remember the days when diseases were named after locations? Long Island ticks are a veritable Airbnb of pathogens, <laughs> and a single tick may harbor Babesia, Borrelia, and Anaplasma. The island's various tick-borne maladies include Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and Poisson virus. According to Long Island's woes, adding to Long Island's woes is the Lone Star tick associated alpha-gal allergy where a few of the bitten are stricken with an allergy to red meat, perhaps a health benefit in disguise, certainly a relief to ruminants. <laughs> That's great. You get it, Dixon? A relief to ruminants. Got it, got it. So actually, I had a patient this week who was quite worried after a tick bite. Am I going to be allergic to red meat? I was like, exactly. <laughs> I think it'll be okay. It's funny. Yeah, Suffolk right. County, where our patient lives, has the highest rate of Babesia infection rate in New York State. There are 163 reported cases there in 2016. Our patient has tick exposure due to her backyard bushwhacking. She is at risk for more severe disease due to age over 50 years. Other risks for severe disease, asplenia, immunosuppression, various other comorbidities. Preferred diagnostic test is blood smear examination, but if paracetamia is low, molecular testing is needed. It's unclear why the patient's tick-borne disease panel did not pick up Babesia since the standard panels usually include it. A brief differential within the infectious realm, malaria, anaplasmosis, Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, Poisson virus, RMSF, that's Rocky Mountain spotted fever, leptospirosis. Our focus on pathology and illness, however, shouldn't overlook the fact that the majority of Babesia infections are asymptomatic. Treatment, tovaquone, azithromycin, or clindamycin quinine for severe prevention of tick bites discussed below in a terminal curiosity. Thank you for not rationing rationality. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So he gives all his uh, references here. And I will go down to, um, uh, so he's got two sections called meaty news and bloody news and um, lousy, lousy news, <laughs> trench fever, eponym news. Babesia is named after Victor Babes, by the way, a Romanian uh, who worked in Vienna with Virchow, Koch, Pasteur, and Cornel. Wow. Yeah, he's exactly. really uh, he's got a good pedigree. Worked on he cattle does. Texas fever, uh, cattle babesiosis, and finally, our terminal curiosity is body condom. Stay cool and ectoparasite free with these fashionable insect impervious garments. You'll be the envy of the garden club. And he sends some catalog <laughs> listings for a full body coverall. Uh, and uh, gators, bug out gators. And you know what a gator is, right? You put it over your boots. You do. Wow. Thank you, Kevin. I got. I always get my titles from Kevin's writing, episode titles. <laughs> Such good one, one small um, quibble. Yep. It's it's not potpourri, it's potpourri. 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 Yep, potpourri. that's correct. Potpourri. For once you are right, Dixon. Not just for once. <laughs> I'm frequently right I'm and frequently wrong. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But you are you have no qualms about being wrong, right? There. Not one little bit. Not one Neither little do bit. we. Neither do we. That okay. was the famous I uh, like the Lee Iacocca, like we learn a lot from our mistakes. I really don't want a lot of my employees learning on the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> learn at a lot of other people's expenses. <laughs> you can learn at home. All right. You so can learn at home. Well, Dick Daniel, where does this leave us? A lot of people uh, like Babesia, but not everyone. We had some stray guesses. Oh, you wanted to return to one of those emails, right, uh, Daniel? Yeah, I did. But um, let's let's first. Uh, I think we have two more people that get to weigh in, right? Um, we do. We I do. I don't see do. any more here on the list. Huh? So, Dixon, do you want to weigh in? <laughs> If I did, I'd be embarrassed. You would. <laughs> yeah, I have a COVID uh, acquisition of weight, unfortunately. So <laughs> I, I 
lean in favor of a diagnosis of babesia, but to be honest, it's very difficult to diagnose this case without more laboratory supporting evidence. Mm -hmm. And if I can't look at a slide of a blood smear and see the parasite, I'm just whistling in the dark. I think so these this, are good guesses, but yeah. I, I, for a definitive diagnosis, uh, we should see the blood smear. So I'm, I'm sure that's what you're going to show us. But in All the right, meantime, so I'll throw my hat in the ring and say. Uh, so Dixon wants a confirmatory blood smear. Absolutely. But it sounds like you're leaning towards babesiosis. I am because there's a whole lot of other things it could be, but she's in the wrong location for them. You know, it certainly can't be malaria, outright malaria. It's mm. really, she didn't. Yeah, she well, didn't travel anywhere, so it's not malaria, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, what about a hookworm? Someone said hookworm, Dixon. Nah. No. That's not. No. Yeah. No, did we don't. Do we have hookworm up here, Dixon? In the dogs, yes. Not in the people. All right. Not in people. Well, I, you know, my initial the reason I asked mosquitoes because I was thinking West Nile. Sure. Sure. Uh, I That's think right. everything she has is consistent with West Nile. I mean, the stool can just be a secondary effect, right? Um, yeah. But she doesn't have encephalitis. No, and not everyone gets encephalitis, though, right? But people her age usually do. No, it's not 100%. It's high, but it's, it's not 100%. 100%. I said usual. usual. Okay, Dixon. But anyway, I think the over, I mean, the epidemiology really suggests Babesia because they have a lot of cases yeah. on Long Island. That's right. And, uh, That's exactly right. I would. I would have to change it to that anyway. This is TWIP. Daniel would never give us a virus on TWIP. No, he would never do that. <laughs> he only might. <laughs> Someday he'll surprise us, but I don't think today yeah, exactly is exactly right. I'm being too pandemic pleasant. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so, um, you know, we, we do see West Nile, and actually um, I've seen, uh, we had a case earlier, um, it was about two months back about West Nile encephalitis that I took care of. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we think about 5% of people who get West Nile virus get an encephalitis. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that percentage is going to be higher based upon age. You know, I, my, I'm going to, um, this is, I'm digressing. Okay. <laughs> so please do, virus, please but do. that's okay. Um, so yeah, I diagnosed the first case of West Nile virus in Colorado, uh, you know, ah. many, many years ago. Um, and um, then actually a couple of years later, when we had full-fledged um, West Nile virus, um, Fort Collins was the epicenter. Yeah. There wow. were more cases per capita. And I was uh, practicing in, in Fort Collins at the time. Um, so it got a tremendous experience with, um, with West Nile in, um, mm -hmm. in Fort Collins. And I saw far too many patients uh, develop encephalitis. Uh, and it was interesting. A lot of them were not that old. You know, these were a lot of individuals in their 50s, so it was pretty pretty significant. So here's right. the, um, you know, West Nile by age group. Yeah. 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 You can see it going up. Uh, yep. But this is incidence per 100,000. Yep. So we are, for those just listening, we are now sharing a graph which has incidence per 100,000 <laughs> population. Um, right. And then it shows that basically it marches right up by age. You really start to see an increase thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. And when you're above 70, um, really, you know, over 1.2, um, or about 1.2 per hundred thousand population. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so nice for the nice screen share. There. That was for a lecture um, from my, vir my summer virology course. It comes in handy. Yeah, I actually I took I took care of a um, of a researcher actually at the CDC lab in um, Fort Collins hmm. who was working with with West Nile virus was injecting sure. uh, tail vein injections, and she actually injected herself accidentally Oops. with West Nile virus, and uh, yeah, so we had to go through the whole thing. This is back before you had um, you know commercially available serology tests, and we were working with the CDC to follow right. the clinical course of when you inject yourself with West Nile. So sure. Um, I know there's a little bit of a controversy about what, what biosafety level you want to work with. Um, but you know, if you're going to work with West Nile, please don't inject yourself. Let's no. avoid that. Um, no. but yeah, so this, this is a, a parasite, uh, focused, uh, podcast. So, so exactly. I, you know, I'm going to be nice. I haven't thrown any non parasites at non parasite cases at people yet, but I think it's important to think. And I wanted to go back to that, um, that email where someone says, wow, this case sounds just like COVID mm -hmm. because we had, uh, I just this week was talking to one of the ER docs and they had a woman who came in 
with babesiosis, who they just basically were treating as a sure. highly clinically suspected COVID because the uh, the overlap could be so impressive. Yeah. And then right. someone actually, it clicked and they realized this is actually Babesia. Wow. How about that? Yeah. So that it, so in our case, in this woman, um, we actually went ahead and we did a peripheral smear as well as a blood PCR. The blood PCR comes back quickly. So quickly we got that it was Babesia PCR positive. And actually mm. the blood smear, you can actually just look at your CBC. And if they have enough, which this woman did, enough um, peripheral um, RBC parasitemia, you can actually see the, um, the parasites in the red blood cells. Yep. Um, the, the Maltese cross that we talk about, um, because of the tetrad um, um, division of this um, parasite, you only see that about 15% of the time. Uh, I know that's sort of taught where you're going to see that all the time. So mm. don't rule it out just because you didn't see that, um, but you sometimes can see that. And it's actually... Um, it's fun to just run down to your blood lab and look at the peripheral smear. It doesn't necessarily have to be a special, um, you know, parasite blood smear. You can just say, Hey, can I see that CBC and pop it under the microscope? Right. Um, the interesting things about this case, right. Is that, um, you know, hematology oncology got involved because she had this pancytopenia and everyone was worried about, do we need to do a bone marrow? And I actually said, let's just hold back. Let's treat her. Um, the low sodium elevated, liver enzymes, so that's your AST and ALT, can be elevated. Um, and when we treated this woman, everything got better. Hmm. The white blood that. cells came back, the anemia resolved, the platelets came up. Um, she didn't have splenomegaly, right? I'm always trying to feel that, and I, I have a lot of respect for my physical exam because, you know, when I go to Africa, that's all you got. There's no, you know, right. limited ultrasounds. You're not going to get CAT scans. Um, and yeah, she, she did not have uh, splenomegaly. Uh. All right. And treatment? Uh, treatment was the uh, tovaquin and azithromycin, as I think some of our emailers wrote in. Yep. Good. All right. Uh, now, um, time to give away a book. We had 13 guesses. And by the way, if you're looking at the video, you can see in my background a stack of eight, uh, seventh edition. However, they're not signed because no one can come here. <laughs> so we have to wait. For both Dixon and Daniel to come in and sign them before I, I have true. no I have no sign anything anymore of uh, PD, so we'll have to wait. So please be patient, but we will put you on the list. And uh, so thirteen guesses, random number between one and thirteen. Dixon, drum roll, please. Thirteen. Wow. Thirteen, lucky number thirteen. Daniel, it's Daniel. Daniel, you want a copy of your own book? No, it's a different Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> he gave a very short answer. Look at that, he won. That's How right. About that. Okay, Daniel, fabulous the winner. Send uh, your address to Oyers in Italy. Oh, <laughs> oops. I know. Hand deliver it. We need a phone number. <laughs> yeah, you'll need a phone number as well as address because for international shipping, TWIP. At microbe.tv. It's true. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your guesses. Just keep trying. You know, eventually you will get it. The luck of the draw, because people who won, we pull out of the draw and, you know, just keep trying. Just keep trying. Yeah. And I think as Daniel taught us that, you know, if you just have a few minutes and you know what it is, or you think, you know, just shoot off. Yes. The guess. You know, you don't, you know, I, I know people may feel intimidated by, uh, you know, some of our multi-page <laughs> emails that we get, but yeah, just shoot an email. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, we love them all. We love all the emails. They're great. We do. We do. Okay. All right, you have a paper here. D Dixon, did you pick this paper? I did well, pick this paper. Well, then you tell us, what is this all about? So, well, I can't tell you what it's all about because I, I don't <laughs> understand the physics <laughs> behind making three-dimensional electron micrographs. And that's basically what this paper is all about. This, But it takes the life cycle of Plasmodium falciparum and it um, uses a new iteration of 3D uh, electron microscopy. And so the, in the abstract, they, their first sentence really says everything about the paper. It says, new techniques for obtaining electron microscopy data through the cell volume are being increasingly utilized to answer cell biologic questions. Here we present a three-dimensional atlas. A three-dimensional atlas 
of Plasmodium falciparum ultrastructure throughout the parasite cell division. Multiple wild type schizonts at different stages of segmentation or budding are imaged and rendered, and the 3D structures of their organelles and daughter cells are shown. So when I first saw this paper in Plus Pathogens, I was mildly impressed because, you know, I like visual things anyway. And I think everybody does, as long as you can see it happen, you more or less believe what you're looking at, as long as it's explained properly. The figures are beautifully done. The figures have drawings and they have rendered electron micrographs next to them so that you can tell what part of the life cycle you're looking at. Remember, Plasmodium falciparum can be grown in vitro and it can be synchronized so that you can get a whole bunch of cells at the same stage of the parasite's life cycle. And therefore, you're almost guaranteed of getting good pictures uh, when you take samples and put them under the electron microscope for visualization. And the figures are absolutely phenomenal. And I, when I sent the article to Daniel for uh, approval, he says, oh, I love graphic novels. <laughs> I said, you know what? This, that's a perfect description of this because you actually don't even need words to go along with this. If you know anything about the life cycle of, of, para, of plasmodium, you know, first of all, it starts out as a common cytoplasm. The nuclei divide. The cytoplasm stays common to the nuclei until the very end when the parasite is about to burst out of the red cell. It leaves all of its waste products behind in the form of hemozoan, and it can, in each one of the merozoites that breaks out then invades a new red cell. This is a fantastic visualization. I'm, I'm just um, still super impressed by it, and uh, I... Um, as you page through these figures, you end up with some remarkable um, visualizations, which you couldn't have had from two-dimensional structures, actually slicing through the red cell, making thin sections, and then just examining them by classical electron micros microscopy. Uh, here, you get, the, you get various dimensional levels of the same um, red cell infection, and when you put those slices together, you can get this uh, by computer to give you a three-dimensional view of what's going on. And yeah, I, think I, that's, I actually, that's, that's what I said when, when Dixon sent it to me. I was like, this is, reminds me of like the Neil Gaiman Stardust or the V for Vendetta <laughs> graphic novel. And, um, you know, because you always learn this stuff and sometimes you learn sort of in a dry, like a, you know, a two-dimensional drawing of this is the life cycle but this is amazing to actually really see it and and there was a, an advance exactly. here too it's not just cool it's not just that this is amazing to actually see this microscopic stuff occurring right. um, but they actually were able to learn that this um how am i going to pronounce this Skyzogeny, my Skyzogeny, 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 Skyzogeny. That 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 thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, when there's the production of these daughter shells in this shared cytoplasm, um, yeah. there's actually a bit of asynchronous. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. and and everyone had always taught this as nope, it just sort of all happens at once, magically timed. Um, yeah, but there's yeah. actually an asynchrony here to the rounds of nuclear and organellar, um, organellar replication. Right. Um, so yeah, it's um, I, not only is it a beautiful paper. I'll sort of encourage everyone to go through it. You don't have to be a. Um, I don't think you have to be a parasitologist, but just if you enjoy just seeing um, beautiful images, they really do a great job. They do. Paper. And they also uh, colorize. They colorize the organelles, yeah, so that yeah. you can keep track of them as the organ as they develop throughout the infection. And it's it's something that it's almost like watching a movie of the parasite's life cycle. Uh, in fact, they do have a video that they've yeah. included into okay. this uh, paper, and that's quite interesting to to look at that as well. But you don't have to be familiar with parasites at all to be, to appreciate the artistry of of what this opens up in terms of process. Vincent, what if you could watch viruses replicate like this? Yeah, it would be very cool. Someday. Um, in real time. We can do that one day, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, each protein of the yeah. virus could be colorized, yeah. and you could watch it assemble inside oh. the cytoplasm or nucleus, wherever it's – and you could say, well – 
my God, I mean, this is watching something that took years of study to learn in each little part. And in, in 20 minutes, you can see the whole yeah, thing. I mean, we are part. coming close to it. We can do a lot, but we're not quite at the resolution for viruses. So this is a PLOS pathogens paper. So it's That's open right. access. Anybody can go look at it. Exactly. And by the way, it's from Harvard uh, Medical School, Harvard University, Carl Zeiss yep. Microscopy. <laughs> yes. Okay. The yes, authors yes. are Rudloff, Kramer, Marshman, and Devorin. And I just want to point out that the technique used is called I focused ion beam scanning microscopy. So what they do is they focus an ion beam, and it the beam actually cuts. The, the sample is embedded in sure. plastic. And it's the like beam a, cuts with nanoscale precision. It's like a CAT scan almost, right? Like uh, very thin uh, four nanometer sections. That's right? incredible. And it generates all these sections, which can then be photographed separately, and then the images are all assembled computationally to produce the three-dimensional right. image, right? Exactly, exactly. And they exactly. say, you know, you can't do this by hand. It's just too laborious. So this is automated, and that's sure, the beauty sure. of this. It's so, so you had mentioned one thing, Daniel. Is there anything else new that you discover? I mean, I see that this is these are beautiful, and you know they they explain in detail what we know. Is there anything that we discovered from this that we didn't know? I, I think that that was the discovery was okay. that there's an asynchrony to this final nuclear division, and before right, we had always right, thought it was that's right, synchronous. That's right. That's right. Um, and it really took breaking it down and, in a sense, watching it happen to see the asynchrony. So that, that was the, I'll say that was the discovery. And interesting enough, what they actually are saying is, yeah, that's the discovery, but by the way, this is a this is something that should be added to the the toolbox for um, understanding um, you know cell biology processes like this. So the discovery exactly. is, is sort of this asynchrony, but more than anything, it's the demonstration that you can apply this technique to understand sure. uh, what were previously thought to be understood processes. Right. Very cool. Yep, that's, I would make, uh, I would put this on YouTube if I were them. Set it to music. <laughs> There you go. Put it there on you YouTube. go. Put Maybe some it. bluegrass. Some trampled, some trampled by turtles. <laughs> well, I'll have to come up to snuff on that one. <laughs> well, Dixon's a jazz guy. He doesn't like uh, bluegrass, right? Tra trampled by turtles is what I would pick, I think. Yeah, let's do bluegrass. some trampled by turtles. So that'll be our recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, I, I, I got some trampled by turtles right here. Let me just briefly... Uh, I can play you a very brief cut. Listen to this. Here we go. You ready? Yes. Oh, you can hear it. How do I get the sound going through? How do you How do you share share your sound? Just turn it up. Put your microphone oh, near on. it. You're not hearing it, right? No, no. No, Vincent. Maybe you could just sort of uh, hum hum a little bit. Or <laughs> I'll yeah, go grab my this. I'll go grab my flute and since you guys are safely, you know, not in an aerosol uh <laughs> position. I can do my trombone, but you wouldn't like it. <laughs> no, I can't I can't share it with you guys, unfortunately. It'd have to I'd have to be connected through my board, but anyway, go listen to oh, Tweevo. People can listen to Tweevo. Listen yeah. to Tweevo, hear a little bluegrass. That's true, that's true. Trampled by turtles dot com. <laughs> Funny name. All right, that brings us to our last part, which is a new case. Indeed. Yeah, you know, you, I keep a list, right, of different ones. But then this was a lady that I just saw on Tuesday. Uh -huh. um, so, and I, and I thought people would <laughs> enjoy this. So um, I'm going to be seeing her for follow-up in the next couple of weeks. So actually, before we, before we twip again, I'll even have a little more information. Um, but I think I've got enough now to, this will be another one of these pandemic pleasant, hopefully, ones that people will say, oh, I know what this one is. Um, so this was a, um, we'll say a middle-aged woman who was quite upset. And she was referred to me um, by her other doctors who said, you need to see an infectious disease physician. Um, and this woman has been sheltering at home. And um, the story she describes for me is one day she was looking at her, um, one of her children, and she noticed that there was a problem with her vision. Um, and she demonstrated for this for me as well. She, when she covers her right eye, she notices that there's an area of loss of vision in her left eye. She had no other associated symptoms. She felt perfectly well. She's been sheltering at home. Um, but she noticed that she had lost uh, an area of vision in her left eye. She initially was admitted to the hospital. 
Um, they did a bunch of blood tests on her. She actually had had an eye exam um, where they noticed that there was actually a lesion in the back of the eye that had developed. Uh, some of the blood tests they had done um, were West Nile virus serologies. And initially they thought, oh, maybe that explains what's going on. Um, but then a little more history and another blood test was actually done. Um, I'm not going to tell anyone what that blood test is yet, um, but it does come back positive. So a sero serological test comes back positive for something. Um, they notice that there's a lesion in the back of the eye. I, I recommend that we get a retinal specialist involved. And there's a couple of really good retinal specialists in our area. There's one here in Garden City. There's a couple in the city. Um, I repeat so we're going to talk about the confirmatory serology for that that test um, there's no there's no cat or dog exposures or significant cat or dog exposures that i'm able to elicit she otherwise is a healthy woman with no prior medical problems no significant surgeries in the past it was like a shoulder surgery something like that but otherwise um pretty benign no toxic habits, right? Um, you know, we don't know her HIV status, but she's happily married. There were no no significant risk factors that we could, um, I guess she could be unhappily married and it would be fine, but there's no <laughs> sexual exposures um, outside the marriage that we're, um, that we're aware of or that there seems to be concern for. Uh, and yeah, and the, the only thing on physical exam, right, was the fact that she has this area of vision loss in her left uh, visual fields. Right. And then she only noticed this when that one day when she decided to cover her eye. Well, she noticed when she was looking at her son that there was just something seemed to be an issue with her vision. And when she covered the right eye, she was, hey, there's an area of vision loss in my left eye. And she can't associate with any point in time before that, right? Yeah, I was going to ask about that. And yeah, her, no, her, her, no. she's living with her husband. Is he okay? He's fine. Everyone else is fine. Just her with this area of visual field. She happens. work in the garden. <laughs> um, uh, she she does a little bit of work out in the garden. Yeah, that's actually a good question. Is she an omnivore? Yes. Um, no, no. She she eats. Uh, she's a bivore. What do you call it when you eat more than one thing? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm I'm not a vegan. She's not a vegetarian. She's not, she's not a vegetarian. She eats whatever she likes. She no, eats no significant dietary restrictions. She, she does eat meat. Yeah. Does she eat it well done? Is it raw? Does she eat uh, tartare? Um, no significant raw meat ingestion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And hasn't been anywhere in a while, right? Uh, no. When, when, when was her last? Out. When was her last trip? You know, some of these things have long incubation periods. <laughs> yeah, you know, so she hasn't traveled in a long time, and um, yeah, that's. Um, I think those are good questions. Mm. Uh -huh. Tell us again how old she is. Um, she's middle aged. Middle aged in the middle of her life, so fifties. <clears throat> and that's when she yeah. first noticed it. Yeah. You know, and it is interesting. I, I think people have sort of lost asking about travel histories, but I think, as I mentioned, it was on TWIV. I, I took care of a woman who had flown in from Pakistan sure. with COVID, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, people are still traveling. Uh, um, yeah, yeah so this yes, woman had so. not flown in from Pakistan with COVID. So, right. She'd been um, staying in the Long Island area. And she's also in Long Island area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm. wow. This is quite interesting. Yeah, Very I'm going to just, this will be, because I, I like where your questions went, but I, I, I'm going to try to help people get this correct. I'm going to say that the toxoplasmosis uh, serologies um, were all negative. Ah, that's why, nice. I asked, why I asked about raw meat, yeah. Yeah, because I want to, yeah. And that's what's, okay. Uh, I still have okay. another answer up my sleeve. That's what I want to do. I want to. I want to give people. You know, I want to be nice here. I want people thinking about the differential. But, but what was that serology test that I, I may have? Uh, yeah, Daniel, may have uh, you didn't do a brain scan, did you? Um, she she actually did have a scan, and that was I'm going to say unremarkable. Yeah, the lesion on the retina was it identifiable as a particular type of lesion, like granulomatous or? That's a good. A, a, that's good. So we're going to have we're going to have our retinal specialist uh, yes, findings. Yes, we're going to yes. discuss those at the next time. And I want to give away too much, but I I think people are going to hopefully people are going to get this. All right. Well, they just have to do Doctor Google Dixon. What's a granuloma? Uh, it's a 
lesion that's uh, resolved, uh, and what's left is uh, the the uh, last set of invasion cells, which then converts the tissue to um, a general lesion of, of, of sort of a generic lesion, basically. It's got fibroblasts in it. Uh, it's got macrophages, that sort of thing. It's, it's characterizable, but it's a, it's a result of an old right. uh, process. Got it. So is that something like you would have from tuberculosis, Daniel? Oh, Actually, yeah. yeah. So it's a structure it's a formed by right. inflammation. Um, it's a collection of immune cells. Uh, usually there are macrophages as part That's of right. this lesion. That's right. Um, and there are particular. So, so this will be why um, we'll like that input from our uh, retinal specialist or a really good ophthalmologist can recognize um, the actual um, immune characterization of this retinal lesion that this woman yes. seems to have developed. And in some instances, with regards to parasitic infections at least, the remnant of what caused the granuloma it can still be visualized. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Daniel, how are you on time? You need to run? No, if we have a few uh, take emails, a couple I've of e got a little yeah. time. Yeah. Let's take a couple of emails. First one here is from uh, Andrea, who writes, I'm a new listener, although longtime listener of TWIM. Can't get enough of your podcast these days. Currently 16C Cloudy, Vancouver, BC. Also enjoying virology lectures, though much of it is beyond my ability. I love to try and learn. After listening to TWIP 182, I would like to share an apartment experience with the notorious bed bug and its eradication without the use of serious chemicals, the kind that make you sick. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's a TWIP listener. I suffered bites of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as described, which were horribly itchy and painful. I was horrified that we had bed bugs, but did not want to go the pesticide route or relocate. As rental apartments are few and far between, you can end up with worse. Later, after much laundry washing, plus a very worthwhile investment in a mattress cover, the odd bed bug was still crawling out of woodwork or ductwork, and we recovered unwelcome. We received unwelcome visits from these tourists in the bed. Eternal mm -hmm. vigilance is required. That's right. After internet research and use of diatomaceous earth as a mechanical insecticide along possible BB roots, we came upon the use of borax, which we added right. in a paste around the bed frame. That's we right. also used borax with laundry detergent, both, both hot wash and added in final rinse. It did the trick. Though it took some months to knock the population down, we were encouraged by the way the pests were weakened and unable to escape us when we changed bedding and did a hunt. Apparently, the borax and diatomaceous earth combo got under their chitinous skins and virtually exploded them in a satisfactory but messy manner. <laughs> I was surprised that nobody else has suggested this method because it cannot be original with the long history that humans have with these infestations. Drier heat may work, but the laundry room of a building with infestations is not the place to try that method. I've heard that there are dogs who can be trained to scent out their hiding places, but I hadn't noticed sure. odor. I suspect the smell would be from remains of their blood meal. I really like the idea of black plastic bags of clothing and heating in the sun. Somehow, I don't think the climate of BC would be cooperative. Hmm. Thanks for your wonderful podcast. We'd welcome you into our home, but you might hesitate after hearing about my less welcome <laughs> visitors, Andrea. Thank you very much. It's good to know. I was entertained by that. You know, I actually, it was yesterday, I was at the hospital. And one of the neurologists was uh, seeing a patient who had um, significant confusion, um, was a bit delirious, was was seeing bugs on the walls. And, really? was, and, and was convinced that these these bugs that only they could see were bed bugs crawling around the walls. And the neurologist came out and said, well, uh, you know, Dr. Griffin, don't worry. I explained to them that they were not bed bugs. They were wall bugs because they were on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Daniel, sure. can, you, can you take uh, the next one, Daniel? Sure. Addie writes, dear Twippers, in my last email on Twib, you wondered whether I was he or she. I can assure you that I am definitely he. Before <laughs> I had enough Twib, I discovered Twip while I was reading about Dixon on his Wikipedia page. Oh, Although dear. initially I was disappointed that I didn't discover your podcast much earlier. Now I feel that I am overcompensated because I don't have to wait for another episode to be released. I can listen to as many episodes as I wished per day. I'm still in the beginning of the episodes. I'm originally from Ethiopia. 
And in my early career as a young doctor, I was involved in management of patients with onchocerciasis in a rural part of the country and was later briefly involved in the African Program for Onchocerciasis Control, APOC mission for mapping of the disease. In clinic to diagnose the disease, we used to give patients a single dose, a uh, low right. dose of diethylcarbamazine, right. DEC, and bring them back the next day. If the intensity right. of itching was worse, right? We this I think we discussed this in our book. We consider this as a confirmatory test for onchocerciasis and gave them the full dose or full course of DEC. Ivermectin was not available in our center yet. I used to feel sorry for the uh, patients, especially the kids, um, enduring the itching. I now know that this is called the Mazzotti reaction and happens due to reaction as a result of death of the microfilaria. Right. I must admit that I didn't have an in-depth understanding of parasites in general at the time. Now it is all making sense. Thanks to your brilliant and wonderful podcast. <laughs> um, you guys are fantastic. Yes, <laughs> Dixon is such a wonderful conversant and historian. He makes the episodes look like a Netflix series. Oh, shucks. <laughs> no, this is great. That's kind. I got to pick that one out and put that one on my wall. Can you yeah. believe Thank that, you, th that he writes, I had enough of TWIV? <laughs> This is remarkable. You know, it's actually like if you listen, if you pick up like a new TV show or something, you know, you always have to worry like, are they going to cancel it after the first exactly. season? So it's always better. Like, and this is the great thing about like Twip or Twib. You just go, oh my gosh, there's a decade of episodes. So, uh, right. You know, right, right, right. If, if you like it, it's going to be okay. You're not going to suddenly run out of episodes. Just think, uh -oh. Dixon, long after you and I are gone, people can keep listening. I, I take great comfort in that. I'm sure uh, you Anthony do. writes, <laughs> <coughs> greetings, Twifozoites. I just want to thank you all for the podcast. As somebody who is self-taught in biochemistry, do not ask how that happened, and who has a colleague who is heading down the same path, your easily absorbed podcast and Vincent's Virology Lectures in 2019 series on YouTube have greatly helped me and her along our rather unconventional paths. We both have a home PCR kit, and we used to really, and we used to analyze non-pathogenic microfungi where we live. I will not have a guess at the case in TWIP 181, as I am rather bad with ectoparasites, and I'm rather more interested in pathogenic fungi and fungi-like organisms. Think such fascinating horrors as Balbuthia mandrillaris, but I am part partly writing to share with you a recently discovered worm that mimics the symptoms of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis to be a T, but Eve is even more rare and deadly than the mentioned flagellate. The worm was briefly mentioned in a letter in TWIP 132, I believe. It is known as Halocephalobus gingivalis, and it's some and is sometimes a lethal pest of livestock, but human infections mimic PAM, that's uh, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, and there has been no reported survivors unlike with PAM. I'm wondering if Dr. Griffin has ever learned about it. It appears resistant to the Benz, Ben. Bendazole, bendazole, sure, you know that the bendazole class of drugs. Once again, I thank you all for your work you do, and hope to hear more stories from Dixon about fish parasites that they are very, very interesting. <laughs> Sincerely, Anthony. Yeah, this was. I don't know if you guys remember. There was like a case of uh, a Polish horse with this. And then, yes, I do. Um, re I do remember, remember the, the Polish. <laughs> no, I, I remember why. the name of this weird parasite because I'd never heard of it before. <laughs> yeah, Halicocephalobus. Gingivalis, yeah. So it's uh, there's been like a few case reports of this. It's one of those rare, you know, described. There's probably you know you got to figure there's something got to be something really unique about these human beings that get something like this, some unique defect in their immune system that or behavioral. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go there. <laughs> oh, no, please. <laughs> I guess maybe you get it from kissing a horse, right? But, uh, well, that's how MERS is acquired from from camels, so why not? Maybe it could be droplet spread, right? If you're too close to a talking <laughs> horse, right? And you know, you're not, you know, maybe Mr. we'll see this now that we wear masks, you know. <laughs> oh dear. Don't want to belittle the fact that it can be pathological and, and uh, lethal. 
that's, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's always tragic, right? You know, we, there's an entertaining aspect and an interesting intellectual aspect, but there's also, you know, as, as I think, you know, there's a tragic aspect to, um, you know, lethal meningeal, um, encephalitic, um, parasites. And exactly. so, yeah, yeah, it's really, um, I mean, I always think of angiostrongulus cantonensis as the gold standard for that. But uh, here's another one we can add to. No, that. and actually, I remember people were quite upset when we were joking about the group of individuals that were sharing. Yeah, they were sharing a drink, and there was actually a slug in that drink. And then the people got quite sick from that. They did. Um, they certainly did. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that is TWIP 186. You can find the notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can subscribe on your podcast player. Please subscribe so you get every episode. We can count who's listening. If you uh, like what we do, you can support us financially. Microbe.tv slash contribute and questions or comments, their guesses for the cases. TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin's at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Always a pleasure. Dixon de Pommiers at Tricanella.org and TheLivingRiver.org. Gracias, Dixon. De nada, Vincenzo. Uh, I don't know why I'm speaking Spanish. <laughs> or, or I answered you in Spanish and Italian. <laughs> grazie. De nada. Grazie, grazie. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at Virology.blog. The music on Twip is by Ronald Jenkins, and thanks to ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic.